Good morning, everybody. It's Stephen here for The Idiot Quilter for episode 99, Project Updates and Subscribers Quilt of the Week. And you know, I just thought of something. I probably shouldn't say good morning. For me, it's morning because that's what usually when I do my uh, recording of these episodes. But you could be watching it at any time of the day or night from wherever you are in the world. So I suppose I should not say good morning. I should just say good day. And by the way, good day is something that's Aussie, but it's also Canadian to say that. But anyways, hello, good day, whatever. Okay, so lots of things to talk about today. So let's jump right in with what I did this weekend. Uh, on Sunday, this past Sunday, we had another so day from my guild. It's a virtual one, of course, done by Zoom. And you've heard me talk about those before. We're trying... Uh, the executive of the guild are trying to possibly do two of these a month. I do enjoy them. And as I've said before, I find when I'm quilting with other people, whether it's at a real life uh, retreat, which seemed like so long ago in the past when we used to be able to do those, or virtually, uh, it inspires me, it gets me motivated. I get a lot done, usually. And I did get a lot done this Sunday. In fact, it's behind me. I have finished the top just the top, which is called a flimsy, uh, of my Australian quilt. And so I'm very pleased with the way this turned out. But in order for you to see the finer details of it, I did a, a little video uh, showing this up close and personal. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to insert that video right here, right now. So I have finally finished the top of my Aussie quilt. And uh, usually when I talk about this quilt, I would have it up on my back wall when I'm doing my vlog, but it is so big that uh, you really can't see the whole thing in one shot. Even now as it's hanging up in my sewing area, I can't get it all in one shot. So I thought I'd just take a second and tell you about it while it's hanging up in here. Of course, you've seen the center panel. The center panel was all done as applique. I bought several of these Aussie animal appliques when I was in Australia a couple of years ago. And this is the only one I ever got finished. Um, I'll work on the other ones at another time and make them into something else. Maybe a couple of matching pillows, I don't know. And then around the outside of this, you can see that I did some embroidery. We'll get up a little closer. I have an embroidery file that has these various animals that are indigenous to Australia. And uh, I did them on top of this applique white star on the uh, circle in the square. And those are the colors, the red, white, and blue are the colors of the Aussie flag. And the star is one of the main stars on their flag. It's a seven pointed star called the Federation Star. And I think each point represents a state in Australia. Then what I did was I put this border around here and all of these fabrics I bought in Australia and I purposely bought ones that had indigenous like designs because I think that makes them more unique. Uh, if I had just bought regular fabric like I could have when I was there, it would just be the same kind of fabric as I could get here. So what's the point? Um, and then I did uh, some and these are more difficult to see. Here's a good example. These are um, all done with half square triangles and I made them into sort of chevrons. Uh, and I put those around the outside and I wasn't particularly picky about the fabric I used. I was trying to get sort of a sample of each of the fabrics that I had bought in this. Uh, and you can see that the colors are very vibrant. Um, and again, they feature the indigenous design. Now, when I worked on this, I started in the center and worked out. So these, the quilt is all my own design, but in order to get those pieces to fit along the top and on the side, I did have a blank white square that I had to put in the, each of the corners. And they just looked too stark when I got the rest of the quilt done. So I embroidered out, found a file that had flowers indigenous to Australia, and I printed them out, or not printed them, I embroidered them out, and I made them into an applique, and I put one in each corner of the quilt. And then I just did this border again from strips of fabric that I got in Australia. And uh, the only thing that didn't come from Australia is the white in the background. That was just from my stash. 
Um, now you'll notice that it's not, the borders are not equal. There are three strips in the top and bottom border and there's only two in the side borders. And the reason why is this quilt was coming out very square and I wanted it to be more rectangular in shape. And so that's why I did that. So I could keep going with it, but I'm not. I think it's big enough right now. And uh, so what I'm gonna concentrate my efforts on next is making the backing. And I'm going to use my leftover Australian fabric and I have a lot of it still. And I'm going to piece a backing for this. Now I'm not sure what the design is going to be, but my idea is that uh, when I figure out that design, this quilt could be reversible, meaning like you could use either side of it. Although, of course, the applique is all on this side. So I'm very happy with the way it turned out. And for me, it is a memory of my trips to Australia. So now I've got to do the backing for this and get it all layered and then quilt it. Now for the backing, um, I was looking at my yardage but I don't have anything large enough that is Australian-like. And I still have a lot of the Australian uh, fabric that I bought when I was in Australia two years ago, and I'd like to use it on this quilt. Um, a lot of those pieces are fat quarters that I bought um, just to be able to get them into my suitcase and get them home. Uh, note to self, if I ever go back to Australia, I'm going to take or going to buy when I'm over there another suitcase and fill it with fabric. Um, but anyways, uh, I'm going to do a pieced backing using those fabrics. Now, I don't know what design I'm going to do because in a sense, I'm making a whole nother quilt in it is what I'm thinking. Um, so this project is becoming quite involved. Uh, the idea here is that in a sense, it could be reversible, although on the front we have a lot of embroidery and applique. I won't have any embroidery or applique on the back just simply because it's gonna make it um, even more difficult than it is right now to actually quilt it. And that's gonna be a whole nother ball game how I'm going to do that. I have some ideas, but I think I'm gonna to have to actually draw them out on paper, which is something I don't usually do. Probably should, but I don't usually do it, but I probably will for this one. So this one's still got many miles to go before I get it done. But as I said, I'm going to piece the backing using what I have left over of my, my Australian fabrics. Okay, so that's that project. In the meantime, I'm working on another project. It's my Wild and Loud quilt. That's the one that was made up of all those scraps I got at Christmas time from the Guild, or the Bag of Garbage as I called it. And I showed you the top of that uh, before in an earlier episode. Now I'm starting to work on the backing for that. And you know, I'm piecing the backing of it too because I thought, well, it's a good opportunity to use up more scraps. And I have all these scrap pieces, strips actually, that came from a couple of jelly rolls of batiks that I bought way back when I first got started in quilting a few years ago. It's hard to believe, but I think I've been quilting now for almost three years. How time flies when you're having fun. So I thought, well, let's use those up because they're in pretty wild colors and um, I probably won't use them in another quilt. So let's use them for backing. So I took all the strips and I sewed them together um, into a long strip with, okay, this gets complicated and shouldn't be. I took four strips of fabric from this line. I sewed them together. This is the wrong side actually. Um, sewed them together and I cut them down to eight inch squares. Then I took two squares each. I didn't care what the colors were. I didn't care about the colors when I was matching this up. It's all going to be very scrappy. And I've, right now, this one has been sewn to create two half square triangles. So those ones I just finished sewing up yesterday, uh, so I haven't got them cut yet. Um, once I have them cut in half, then I'm going to use this ruler. It's the strip, the strip tube ruler by Cozy Quilt Designs. This is the large one, and I know you cannot see that. Let's see here if I can make it a little bit more visible. Yeah, it's a little better. Um, and this is a really great ruler when you're making half square triangles of any size, and you get a smaller one as well. And basically, you leave, once you've cut the half square triangle out, 
So you have something like, okay, I'm trying to manipulate my hands here. You have something like that. You lay along the seam line, the stitched line, one of the lines here for whatever size you want. Now, I made these as big as I possibly could from those eight inch squares and that's seven and a half inches. So I lay it on the seven and a half inch line and just trim around and I have a perfect half square triangle. Uh, in the right size. I don't have to trim it up afterwards when I press it and open it. So here's an example of one of those. And you can see uh, that these don't match up and that's okay. I don't want them to match up. It doesn't matter. I'm, it's all for the back of a quilt. Um, I mean, I could have made them match up. I probably would have had to cut this a little smaller to do so, um, but I didn't. I just didn't. So they'll go this way or that way. I don't know which way I'm going to put them, but each one is a little different, as you can see. And uh, yeah, here's, uh, let's see. Find, let's see if I find one that's a little bit more different. Well, that's a little bit more different, but whatever. And these will become the back of my quilt. Now, I think I'm going to get about 56 of these um, squares when I'm done. It's probably not quite enough to cover the whole back of the quilt, but I've got some more scraps that I might go, you know, just border them around. I'm just going to piece them together so they're the right length for going around whatever this comes out to be when I sew it. And uh, yeah, it'll all be scrappy. Now, the other thing too is this is another reversible quilt because I have a feeling that both sides are going to look really cool. And uh, so, when I quilt it, I'll keep that in mind. And um, I don't know what I'm going to do with it when I'm done with it. So probably end up being one of those quilts I really love. That often happens because this one didn't have really a plan. I was just trying to use up the scraps. And uh, when I do that, then I was thinking of donating it to charity and I may still do that. We'll see. We'll see what happens. But I'll be sure to show it to you first before I give it away. Um, better put my little note back on this pile or I'll get my squares mixed up and the next thing you know I'll be chopping things I shouldn't be chopping uh, with my cutter. Okay so those are the two projects the Aussie Quilt and the Wild and Loud that I've been working on. I've been working on them for a while. Um, I have been working as fast as I usually work. It's funny I posted a picture of my flimsy on the uh, Quilters Way which is the online membership group that I belong to and uh, somebody says my God, you're really fast at making quilts. Well, that's all I do. <laughs> I have other things, you know that, uh, but I do tend to be a fairly fast quilter once I get into the groove um, with that. But, you know, like other people, I don't have children to look after. Um, Walter's pretty much able to look after himself, you know, he's potty trained and everything like that, so I don't have to worry about that. We are in lockdown here in Ontario. Um, so there's no place to go. So what do you do? You quilt. Um, so that's why it may seem like I get through quilts pretty fast. Um, now, having said that, lately I have slowed down a little bit. I think it's the month, January. Um, January is a sort of a dull and depressing month. The hubbub of Christmas is over. Um, it's a bit of a letdown. It doesn't help that we're all in lockdown as well. So, you know, there are days when I just don't seem to be moving as fast as I should be or would like to be, but I'm sure that'll perk up. Um, part of it might be, you know, the days are um, short in terms of daylight right now, although we're past the winter solstice, so we should slowly be getting a little bit more light each day up until, you know, the tail end of June. But however, you know, the lack of light does affect people here in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, you know, what they call it, SAD. Um, I'm trying to think what that stands for. Uh, it has something to do with light deprivation syndrome of some sort. Uh, anyways, um, yeah, I think that does affect me uh, a little bit. Just makes things go a little slower. Uh, lately, what's been happening, I don't know how I got on this. This is a tangent, please bear with me. Um, my day usually starts off in the morning. I get up fairly early. I'm usually up and going by a, a little after seven, if not sooner. And uh, I come down and uh, I check 
check my email, do whatever, what I call my paperwork to do for that day, start to plan out my day. I have a little notepad. I write down what I want to get accomplished during the day. I'm a list maker. I need lists to keep me on track. And uh, I get all that done. Uh, lately, I've been setting up the 3D printer to do some kind of print job. It's doing one right now. <laughs> I'm trying to make a holder for my uh, large uh, Virtu um, Nespresso capsules, you know, from my Nespresso machine. Uh, we've been throwing them in a little Tupperware bucket on the shelf, but I saw this design and I thought, oh, a little stand I could make, that might be fun. Um, of course, it's taking 15 hours to make. And that's just one part of it. But, you know, once I get it set up, I just let it go and do its thing. Um, and then um, after I've done all of that, uh, you know, I might look around at a few websites. Uh, I get my notes prepared or updated for my vlogs for the week. And then I come into my sewing room and sit down and start working on another project. And then before I know it, uh, it's lunch. And I have that. And then I'll maybe sew a little bit more up for an hour or two after lunch. And then I have to watch my stories. Don't you know? And what I mean by that is whatever I'm watching on Netflix that I'm binging. And I'll spend probably a couple of hours. I feel a little guilty about doing that. Spending a couple of hours, you know, laying on the couch watching TV, essentially. Well, it's Netflix, but, you know, it doesn't matter. It's still TV. Um... And then by that time, it's time to get up and decide what Walter's going to make for dinner. <laughs> or he decides um, for that. I watch a little YouTube while that's getting going um, to catch up on all the different ones I subscribe to. And uh, then we have dinner. And then the two of us, uh, if it's not a Monday night, Monday nights he usually has his sewing class, a uh, virtual one, go downstairs and watch some more TV. I feel a little guilty about watching all this TV. I try to, to justify it by saying that I'm watching some documentaries and so I'm learning things. And you know, really you do. I do enjoy a documentary, a good documentary. I never did. When I was younger, I wouldn't watch the documentary, put that word in front of me. I don't care what it was about. I wasn't gonna watch it because that would be boring. But I find them, maybe it's my age now, but I'm finding a lot of things that are really interesting in documentaries. I just finished one, watching one that was about a murder case in the States that started in 2001 and carried on right up to present time called The Staircase. It's a little dry, but it's, it's worth watching if you, you know, you're interested in that kind of thing. You know, they really show you the whole court system in the States, how this worked. And basically the guy was innocent, but they tried him and found him guilty anyways. And... There's a little bit of intrigue in it, um, but it's real life stuff. And I did watch recently, and you've got to see it. Somebody recommended it to me uh, on one of my other uh, videos called The Oc Octopus Teacher. It's on Netflix. Um, I saw it come up on Netflix and went, oh yeah, underwater thing. Again, something that doesn't really interest me, but somebody recommended it, so I watched it. Yes, it is well worth watching. The cinematography in it is excellent. It's so beautiful, the colors. You know, maybe that's the quilter in me watching that and pulling and going, oh, I wish I'd get fabric in that color. I wish I'd get fabric in that color. Um, but it's also very, um, well, you'll cry at the end of it. You really will. And I'm not ashamed to admit that I did. Okay. I am an emotional person and I know men aren't supposed to cry, but ah, screw that. I did. It was very touching at the end. And I don't want to give too, too much away from it, but it is a documentary, but it is worth watching. It's about an octopus. Yeah. I've got a new love for octopuses. Always thought of them as kind of creepy little things, but after this, well, you just well, you'll know what I mean at the if you watch it to the end because you'll really want to run out and get yourself an octopus as a pet. I don't think you will, but you know what I mean. Anyways, that was a long tangent, wasn't it? I went off on that. So what was I going to talk about? Good question. Look at my notes. Okay, so anyways, those are the things I've been working on. So I asked last week, if people, if they wanted to, they could send me pictures of their projects, quilting, knitting, sewing, whatever you're working on. Um, 
And if you sent me pictures of it with a little brief write-up describing what it was, whether it's what fabric you use, the pattern, stuff like that, uh, why you're making it, or what you intend to do with it, um, just send those to me and I would feature them. Well, I've got some. And what I've decided to do is to do one a week. Right now I've got three. I need more because I'm going to run out soon. Um, and I'll do just one a week and I'm going to do them in the order they're sent to me. So when the, the email comes in with the pictures, I print it all out. Um, I organize it for myself and um, I, I label it and I label it as to the date that I'm going to show it. So my very first one that came in was by Fidel Leon. She is in, I'm just checking this. She was originally in Pennsylvania. She's moved to uh, Mexico now. And she sent me a picture of a very beautiful quilt. And so what I have done, and this is what I'm going to do with all of them that come into me, I've created a little video that I'm going to cut to right now that talks about um, Fidel's quilt and shows you what it looks like. So that's what we're going to look at right now. This week I'm featuring the work of Fidel Leon and Fidel Leon submitted a couple of pictures of a very beautiful bed quilt she had created and I'm going to read to you what she wrote to me in her description. My name is Fidel Leon and I'm a subscriber to your YouTube channel. I'm submitting my quilt. I lived many years in Pennsylvania. I moved a year ago to Mexico. I started to quilt in PA about two years ago. I made this quilt for a relative. I don't know the name of the pattern. It's a Lone Star with log cabins. It was a challenge and my first try to do a complicated pattern. I enjoyed making it. It took me about three weeks to finish. I quilt it using a Handy Quilter Sweet 16. I really appreciate your time and effort to make all the videos in your channel. If you need more info about the quilt, let me know. Thanks. Well, you know, Fidel, I think this is a beautiful quilt for several reasons. Personally, I love your color choice. Anything with blues in it really gets me going. And also, you've done a Lone Star, and I have not yet made a Lone Star. And I'm wondering if when you made that Lone Star, if there were Y seams. Because you say you've only been quilting for a couple of years, and doing Y seams is definitely an advanced technique, and probably one of the reasons why I haven't made a Lone Star myself. Now, I have done uh, y seams before but you know they take some practice to get them right and they are a little bit tedious but I do love the whole design of your quilt it looks great on the bed and thank you so much for sharing this quilt because as you said it's fairly complicated and for somebody who hasn't been quilting that long you really rose to the challenge thank you so thank you Fidel for that beautiful quilt and uh, next week we'll have another one featured as well. So if you've got ones, if you've got something you want us to look at, remember, we don't criticize, we only say nice things, then come on, stroke your ego a little bit. We all deserve a little stroking, don't we, every now and then? So, and send it to me and I will feature it on here in the next few weeks. Okay, so that takes us to some shout outs. Um, first of all, it's a little advanced for it, but not that advanced. I've, in fact, I got thinking this morning, holy crap, this month is almost over. Here it is January the 26th, and you know, next week we're into February. So in the first Wednesday of every fab February is when I have my craft and chat mini retreat. This is open to all crafters, no matter what your projects are. Um, we've done this a couple of times now, and each time we've had a few new people come on, it's growing, and we have a lot of fun. So I have put, it's a Zoom meeting, so I have put the uh, information for the Zoom meeting in the show notes. So I'll be talking about this again next week as well, because I usually do an idiot quilter before uh, the craft and chat mini retreat happens. So I'll be reminding you of it then as well and also putting the link in the show notes next week as well so you'll get it twice. But um, anyways, that is coming up. So the date is Wednesday, February the 2nd, sorry, February the 3rd at 1 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time, my time. So I hope you can join us. And as I said, 
It doesn't matter what you're working on. It doesn't have to be sewing related. It can be some other craft. You could be painting. You could be scrapbooking. You could be woodworking, whatever. Uh, and we just do it. I don't record the session. It's all very informal, very supportive, and fun. So I hope you can join us. Now, I may, I'm thinking of doing a, a mini demo of my embroidery machine because I've had people who are interested in embroidery machines but have asked me what mine's like and although I have done some videos in the past talking about my machine I really haven't shown it to you in any detail or talked about some of the things I do with it or that so while you're working on your craft I might be just doing a little informal discussion about my embroidery machine at least that's my plan for now we'll see how that works out okay all right so another shout out i wanted to say to chatterbox quilts okay you've heard me mention many times the quilters way which is a membership site it's uh, done by a friend of mine uh as she wasn't a friend of mine until i joined it uh uh okay my friend's name whoa um brain fart kim yeah kim jameson hurst She's out in Calgary. She runs this. Uh, it's excellent, excellent uh, membership site. But if you want to get a feel for it as well, you can go to her YouTube channel called Chatterbox Quilts. And on that, she always gives you a very informative tutorial about something to do with quilting or review of certain Janome machines or products as well. Uh, they're very informative. Kim's very professional uh, when she does those. A lot more professional than me. She's got better equipment, okay? Um, but it's great. And, you know, if, if you go there and you like what you see and you think this might be something you would like to join, then check out The Quilter's Way. Um, there'll probably be a link for it in her show notes for Chatterbox Quilts, but you can just do a search for it as well, The Quilter's Way. And... Uh, check out. I think she has a free um, one week trial or something like that. It is not expensive and I'm telling you the return on your investment for joining that is tremendous. So check it out. Also another quilt store that I really like uh, that's here in Ontario. It's not that far from me. It's a bit of a drive. It's over an hour's drive or so to get there. Um, but they have an online store. Uh, it's called thequiltstore.ca. I have probably have mentioned it in episodes before, but I like it so much I need to mention it again. Uh, their shipping, their service is excellent. Uh, things come to you pretty fast, at least if you live here in Ontario. It's usually sent by Campar, which is a courier, as opposed to Canadian Post, but I'm not sure how they would send it to other parts of Canada um, and to the United States. Prices are reasonable, shipping price is reasonable, and an excellent selection of fabric and notions, and well, it's a full service store. So you might want to check that out, and you can. I've put their link uh, in the show notes below, below, but it's really easy. The Quilt Store, all one word, dot ca, and you'll find it. Tell them I sent you. Not that that's going to do anything for you, but you know, <laughs> I did. And I'm a regular customer. Okay. Uh, and speaking of that, um, I haven't bought any new fabric this week. But just before I did this video, I went on to Peachtree Quilts. That's the one, you know, that I had the coupon for, for everybody use. Stephen Bland 10 to get 10% off your order. They're the place that's located in Regina, Saskatchewan, Canada. And you know how much I love them as well. Well, I showed you the fabrics I bought from them that I that I received last week and you know I really love them I love them so much that I got thinking you know I look over at my vision board and I've got my patterns that I want to do this year up there and some of them I have put a label on them uh, describing the fabric lines that I'm going to use uh, with those patterns well I think I'm going to revisit them because a couple of those uh, fabrics that I bought that I showed you last week from Peachtree Quilts um, I went online today and I bought more of them in the line. Uh, the Fairy fairy Frost was one of them. And the other one was um, Floral Rhapsody and Garden 
something. <laughs> Can't remember what that one was called. Garden something. Anyways, uh, I bought more of those fabrics. A lot more of those <laughs> fabrics. And I'm thinking that I may change out the fabrics I thought I was originally going to use with some of these patterns because I like these ones so much. So I just put that order in today and I also sent Patrick, the owner, a message. I, I wanted to know if there was an expiration on the uh, coupon code he gave me. I know there's been some of you that have gone and done some ordering or checked it out, which is great. And Patrick really appreciates your, your business. Um, do remember, I am not sponsored here by anybody. I'm not getting any kickbacks, okay? I tell you exactly. If it's something I like, I mean it. I don't make it up for any reason. Um, and I did write to him, and I haven't heard back yet because, of course, I wrote that at about 8 o'clock this morning my time. His time out there is, I think, an hour uh, behind us. So, anyways, um, I, I'm sure the coupon code is still good. Uh, well, I know it worked for me because I used it this morning. Um, not trying to take advantage of the generosity of this company at all, but, you know, it's there. Um, and 10% is 10%. So, uh, anyways, I've got those on order, and we'll see how long they will take to get. Uh, as I said before, he sends them by Canada Post. And Canada Post is hit and miss whether things come fast or come slow. And it's okay. I'm not in any rush. I'm not going to get these quilts for get to these quilts for a while so that's okay but the fabric is gorgeous and I can't say enough about peach tree quilts okay so and I'll, I'll post the coupon for them and the link uh, in the show notes um, for this video again okay so that takes us to our notions corner and uh, one of the things I just want to show you quickly it is a notion, um, but I made it. Um, a simple little thing, but I needed another little bobbin holder um, to put next to my secondary sewing machine, and so I made this. And I made it on my 3D printer. And I like it. It, it works. It's simple, but it works really well. It holds 10 bobbins. Um, I showed it to Walter. He wanted one. So I made him one too. And I might make a couple more of these uh, as well. And I'm thinking of sort of gluing them together. There are other bobbin cases I can um, print as well that are bigger, hold more. But I just thought this was kind of a convenient uh, one because basically when I go to do embroidery, I use this thread. It's just a white thread. It's the one that I get from 144 of them for 25 bucks from Monfil. Another shout out, monfil.ca. Love them, okay? And you've I've done reviews about them before on the episodes. Um, but, um, you know, there's still thread left on these. So, but I know they're going to run out really quick uh, when I'm embroidering something. And, you know, in the middle of an embroidery job, you don't want to have to be changing your bobbins a lot. So, I don't get rid of these. I just put them in this little holder, put it next to my secondary machine, and these are the bobbins I use when I'm piecing on the secondary machine. So, you know, it works for me. Um, so, but what I want to focus on today is your rotary cutter blades. And you know something? Rotary cut cutter blades are the most important part of your rotary cutter. Yeah, I know that you take that for granted, right? You have a rotary cutter, you got to have a blade. But here's what a lot of people don't do, and I was one of them as well. Rotary cutter blades, when you buy them, are expensive. Uh, if you buy an original Ulfa blade, one blade can cost you 20 bucks, okay? Depending on where you buy it. Um, I have found, I've gone on Amazon and I've bought third-party rotary cutter blades that, you know, I get five 60 millimeter blades for $11.99 or something like that, or $15.99. And I was a little skeptical when I bought them the first time, uh, but uh, they work fine. And they last, well, I don't know if they last quite as long as an Ulfa, uh, but they last quite a while. And I have the tendency to cut with a doll blade and you should not do that. There's several reasons why you shouldn't do that. One, it doesn't cut your fabric. You know it's doll 
when you know you cut through your fabric and you've got little parts that are still attached and they're a bitch really to cut because it don't, I don't matter doesn't matter how careful you are trying to get those cut again will put a little jag maybe just a small one into your strip or your either side of your your fabric so you know you don't want to do that second of all a dull blade means that you just unconsciously will start to put more pressure on your rotary cutter when you're doing that and that's when you can have a slip and you know the next thing you have is a lovely shade of red all over your fabric because it's you spurting blood okay sorry i should have put in a little warning there may be some adult content here um so you want to have a sharp blade now, there's lots of rules for this. A lot of people say, every time you start a new project, put in a new blade. I don't do that. I put in a new blade when I start to realize I'm having to put more pressure on it or I'm getting those little nicks, you know, the parts that didn't separate when I cut them. That's when I put in a new blade. Now, something I learned very recently, and I'm not sure if it's true or not, and I have tried it and I really can't tell for certain, um, is... There are two sides to a rotary blade, supposedly. So when the one side gets dull, take it out, flip it over, and use the other side. Double the length, uh, double the life of your rotary blade. I'm not absolutely sure or convinced that that really makes a difference or not. But I, next time I do it, my problem is I don't remember that I have done it. So I'm not keeping track. I need to make a note. Okay, I flipped the blade over on such and such a date and see if it's making any difference or not. But another thing you can do, and when I first got into quilting, I did this because of the price of the blades, is buy a system for sharpening the blade. So let me have some coffee here because this is a bit of a tale. So I'm gonna show you three different ones that I have and I'll tell you the one I like the best. Well, you know me and gadgets. I love anything that's a gadget, so I bought this gadget. This is called the True Sharp. It is a rotary cutting, cutting blade sharpening tool. You plug it in, it spins the blade around, it goes inside. And inside you see there's a little block right here. And there's another block up here. And these are basically sharpening stones. Uh, the kind of thing that you would buy if you're doing knives, okay? Um, they come comes with a little bottle of oil. You put a little drop of oil on each one of these little blocks and then let me grab one here. This is a, a used rotary blade. Try not to cut myself. And basically you stick it in here. It sits right in there. You close the lid. And then this isn't plugged in right now, but you press this button on here and you're supposed to let it spin itself for 15, 20 seconds, whatever, 30 seconds. And then take it out, flip the blade over and do it again. And you have a nice sharp blade. Bullshit. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, this does not work. Now this is, now I tried everything. Okay. I've had two of them. Okay, the first one I got, I ordered it uh, through Amazon and uh, the box was all kind of chewed up when I got it. And in fact, it had a label still in this chewed up box that obviously had been opened up uh, with somebody else's name on it. And I'm thinking, oh, either they made a mistake when they were shipping it to me or this was a return and the company sent it back out. So I was very suspicious of it. I read the instructions very carefully and they certainly don't take you long because they're pretty basic. And basically it tells you, quick reference guide on the back, it says, one, keep stones oiled. Two, close lid slowly. Three, flip blade every 30 seconds until sharp. Okay. I probably should go back and retry this again. But anyways, I did all of that and my blade didn't sharpen. Now, one thing they do tell you in the more detailed instructions is, if you've got a nick in your blade, this is not gonna take it out. No sharpening system will take a nick out. If you've got a nick because you ran over a pin or something like that, um, yeah, 
that blade is useless. You can't, you can't salvage it. As far as I know, you can't salvage it. But the blade I had on here is just like the blade I just put in for you. And I did the 30 seconds on one side. I did the 30 seconds on the other side. I tried it out, put it back in the rotary cutter. Yeah. If anything, it was almost worse. I did it again, and I did it again, and I did it again. I made sure the stones were oiled. In fact, you can take the stones out. They have four sides, so you can flip them over. I guess the idea is if the stone will eventually wear out, so you have four sides that you can use, and you can buy replacement stones for it as well. So I was having absolutely no luck with it. So I'm thinking, all right, is there a problem with this? So I wrote to the company. Uh, first of all, I went through Amazon. Now this was sh sold to me by a third party company, but it was not the company, which is, I think the company is called Grace, Grace something, quilting company, something like that. They make the uh, quilting frames, Grace frames, they have all kinds of products. Um, but that's not who I first wrote my complaint to. I wrote it to the seller, third party seller on Amazon. Um, basically, they didn't really answer me. And I think I finally did get an answer, and the answer was, yeah, tough luck. I said to them, I suspected that this had been a used item, had been returned, and so there might be something wrong with it. Yeah, no. So I wrote to Grace, the main manufacturer or supplier of this product, and I told them exactly what my problem was. Oh, and before I did that, I went on YouTube, and they have an instructional video on there on how to use it. I followed the YouTube to the T, and still, the results were not worth the money I paid for this sucker. This little sucker is expensive. It was 80 Canadian dollars, okay? So we're not talking here cheap toy. Um... So I said all of this to Grace, and they were absolutely wonderful. They sent me a completely brand new one. I didn't even have to send this one back to them. I didn't have to prove anything to them. Um, so they sent me a brand new one. I set it all up. I did exactly what you're supposed to do. No. Nope, nope, nope. I did think, okay, I think I tried it on my third party um, blades. I thought maybe it has something to do with those. So I did try it on a used Ulfa blade. Um, and no, same, same results, nothing. You might as well have done nothing with it. So I was very disappointed and I just cut my losses and filed it away in a drawer, okay? So then I went looking again and I saw in my local quilt store they had this. Now, this is a sharpening system too. So basically, there's a sharpening stone that runs inside this groove all the way down. And it's very simple to use. You just, you know, I, I'm not gonna do this the way you should, but you put it down, it's, it's got non-stick rubber feet. You put it down, like say on your cutting mat, and you roll this through back and forth. Make your strokes fairly even and that will sharpen your blade. Yeah, not so well. It did a much better job than the true sharp machine, but still I was not that impressed with it. Uh, again, I made sure I was following the instructions to the T, everything, and yes, it did sharpen a little bit, but it wasn't like getting a brand new blade. Now, having said that, any sharpening device is not going to uh, create an edge on your blade that's like manufactured, fresh out of the box kind of a thing, new one. So you have to expect that. You use one of these just to give you a little bit more time with your blade, okay? So yeah, it was okay. Um, this one cost me about $45, okay, at my quilt store. So about half the price of the true sharp. So then I went on the hunt to see if I could find something else. And I did. I found this. This is a ring. It's a little two part system. It has this to it. And inside this ring, there's a piece of what feels like sandpaper. There's two sides. 
There's a coarse sandpaper. There's a finer sandpaper. And with this, you unscrew this, just like that, a little screw right there. You take your blade, you just center it on there. There's a, it, there's a little plastic piece that rises up that fits perfectly in the hole to keep it steady. Take the other piece, screw that on, stick it in. Now you see it doesn't go through. And on the coarse sandpaper side, you just go like this. And you just keep doing this. Now I think it said in the instructions to do this about 25 full turns. And then when you're finished doing that, you flip it over to the finer and do the same thing. And then what you can do is just turn this around so you've got the other side of the blade and do it all over again. This works. This works. So this is the tool that I use when I want to sharpen my blades. Again, it's not perfect. You're not going, it's not going to handle nicks in your blade and um, you're not going to get exactly the same sharpness as on a, a brand new blade but it gives a little bit more life to your blade. Now, for the life of me, this is called the Tri Sharp. I got it on Amazon. I got it quite a while ago, so I don't know if they're still available or not. I think it might have been 30 bucks. It might have been less, uh, and I'm talking Canadian dollars. But out of the three that I just showed you, this is my number one uh, sharpener. This is the one that I use. So, yeah. Um, so before you start investing in ones that are more expensive than that, and there are others on the market as well. I haven't tried them all, but those were the three. Uh, this is the one I recommend. Okay, so that's what I want to show you today as sort of a product review. All right, what's that taking me to? Okay, so this week I'm going to cut up another quilt. And I'm going to cut up an Aussie quilt. And I'm going to uh, pull it across so you can see it. And I'm going to take the camera off the tripod so we can get up, cl get up close and personal. Okay, I think this was either the third or fourth quilt that I made. And this is another Australian quilt. Yes, I lied to you. Uh, the quilt I've been working on is not my first Australian quilt. But this one is very unique. And this is why I wanted to show it to you. I had just started quilting at the time that I went to, I think this might have been my second trip to Australia. And this time when I went to Australia, I had just got into quilting and I decided I was going to pick up fabric. But I didn't know much about fabric and at the time we were not, uh, we didn't have a car, we weren't driving all around uh, Australia and that kind of thing. So. I thought I would go to wherever I went to a site or something like that, I would pick up a souvenir tea towel or two. Um, so this whole quilt is made up of tea towels. Now, these are linen tea towels. So of course the fabric is heavier than quilting cotton. But the reason I wanted to do it out of tea towels was because uh, I would get all the things like that map in the center and a sample of some Aboriginal art and that kind of thing. That at the time I didn't know if I could get those in fabric or not. So this whole quilt is made up of tea towels. So let's take a little closer look at it. So my center piece <clears throat> um, is not applique. Yes, it is applique, sorry. I cut that map of Australia out of one of the tea towels and I hadn't done applique before. Um, so basically I don't think, no, I didn't even use uh, something like steam a seam on that. I just laid it down and stitched a simple straight stitch all the way around to hold it. Now it doesn't fray though and the reason it doesn't fray is because these are linen tea towels. So that's one advantage of working with linen tea towels, they don't fray. Um, much. So that's how I did that. 
Um, of course, this design is my own and it was the early days of quilting. So I thought, well, okay, now I've got that in the center. What will I do? So I put a white border all the way around it, as you can see. Um, that was tea towel as well. I cut off a piece of, uh, of these stripes or these strips from a tea towel and built out from there. Now, you'll notice at the top, I actually have two flying geese and I did the same on the bottom. At that time, I did not really know what flying geese were. I can't remember. I think I probably looked this up in a book how to do it, and so I did, but my measurements were way off. Thus, the reason you see this little blue strip on the edge of each one of these, so that it would fit in. Okay, math still is not my strong feature in designing quilts but I am better at it. Okay, they don't look too bad there though, but I mean, an experienced quilter would look at that and go, uh, yeah, you had a problem there, didn't you? Because that's really not how a quilt is designed. Uh, why would they pick that up? Because look, see this little border piece here? It doesn't match up. If I was to redo this, this part would be, well, it would come where it should come, uh, you know, lined up properly. So then I carried on with the next border and yeah, it's okay. It's a little wonky in spots. Now it looks a little more wonky because this is not hanging up here perfectly straight on my little wire system. Uh, and this is a heavy, heavy quilt. Believe me, you wouldn't think tea towels would weigh that much, but it does. This is very heavy. So I worked on with it and you can see basically I'm piecing things to fit together. Like, look at this. Yeah, because I'm trying to make this row fit mathematically. And I did it as half square triangles and actually is in an hourglass format. Uh, but uh, you see, I had to add that piece up there and to make it fit and I ended up at least I was able to kind of match it down on this side too so there looks like there's some symmetry but really in terms of design not a good design um, also take a look yeah I'm still having problem with the quarter inch seam allowance on here and I'm cutting off the points on things and I'm not getting them even yeah it's a good thing the fabric's really busy because at first glance, you don't really notice that. But, you know, as I said, anybody with a little experience in quilting, if they really studied this, are going to find all those kind of things. So I worked my way out um, and, well, it doesn't look too bad. I've got my binding on it. Uh, oh, my stitching is so nice and straight, isn't it? Look at that. Wonky, wonky, wonky. Oops, I missed it right there. Uh, but I picked it back up over there. What was I doing? Oh my God. Let's take a look at the corners. Okay. I didn't do too bad with a binding corner there or like a mitered corner, except why do I have, why do I have the thread on the top of this? You can see it. You know why? Because I probably, because I was machine binding it, and and I still do this sometimes, I forget. You should start putting the binding on on the back side and then bring it over to the front side so you can avoid that kind of thing that I'm showing you right there. And of course, my color choice doesn't help. Get it in here. My color choice doesn't help because it kind of stands out against the lighter fabric. Now let's take a look at the quilting. Well, of course I did walking foot straight line. Well, I tried to get the line straight. Look at this. Wow. What did I do there? <laughs> and oh, this one, here's, here's a nice wonk, wonk, wonky little line for you. Yeah, really straight, eh? Not. So let's take a look at the back. Oh, look at this. This is disgusting. Look at the binding. Oh, and the stitching. That is god awful. God awful. Look at that. Look at right off the end. 
Uh, what was I doing there? How'd I do on the corner? Oh yeah, this is a lovely corner. Not. <laughs> oh my. Okay, let's take a look at the back. Okay, the back, I decided to piece with more tea towels. And yeah, it's very colorful. I can't get it all in the shot here. I'll pull back a little bit. Um, well, yeah, <laughs> and it's quite obvious. Uh, oh, this is interesting. Oh, I was, I was purposely making the lines go wonky on the border. Yeah, what a mess. Wavy lines. Well, they're not that wavy. <laughs> So anyways, that was really my first Australian quilt. And as I said, it's very, very heavy, um, full of mistakes. But you know, I learned a lot of things from this. One, my first attempt at applique, okay? I didn't do too bad on that machine. There's nothing on, by hand done on here. This was all done by machine. Um, I was in the early stages of figuring out how to do binding, as can be seen, and I have figured that out since. Um, and you know, it's just an interesting little piece. If a hundred years from now, somebody gets a hold of this, um, well, <laughs> I hope they have some examples of quilts I made after it so they can see that I did learn how to do it. So yeah, I thought I'd share that with you this week and next week we'll take a look at something else that I did after this and see if I got any better. Okay, so that brings us pretty much to the end of this episode, but I just want to give you an update on the response I've had for holding a mini retreat, uh, a quilting mini retreat, um, which actually might be a little redundant since I do craft and chat and you can do anything you want on that. But I did put out a feeler and asked you to let me know if you're interested in doing a little mini uh, quilting retreat on Zoom. And I did get some replies. I got about six people said they were interested and that's fine, but I'm going to leave it before I make any decisions as to whether or not this is going to go and when it's going to go uh, until I see if I get a few more people that are interested. So if you are interested in doing a little uh, Zoom quilting uh, retreat, um, just a mini one, then uh, let me know. Uh, I'll put my email address in the show notes um, so you can either write it as a comment on this video or you can send me an email. Let me know, uh, you know, what day of the week is good for you and what time is good for you. I'm not going to do them in the evening because by then I'm too tired and I'll make mistakes. And um, weekends are a possibility. I am usually tied up on a lot of the weekends, uh, but it, it could work. It could work if that's the only time you have. Um, but ideally, I'd like to do it during the afternoon, during a weekday is the kind of thing I would like. But we'll see what the majority wants and I'll try to accommodate to the best of my ability for that. Um, and we'll see. So let me know. And uh, I will make more of a firm decision on this come next week after I see what I get if I get a few more people interested and I'll go from there and I'll be sure to let you know. Okay. So that's it for this week, I think. Yeah. Um, so I hope you have a good week. I hope you, uh, get lots of opportunity to work on whatever you're working on as well. And I hope you stay ha happy and I hope you stay healthy and right now stay in. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye for now.